Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be taking a look at what is probably the most hated telescope on the market today. Yes, it could only be the Celestron Powerseeker 127EQ. You know, sometimes people ask me, why don't I do more negative reviews? The reviews here seem to be mostly positive or neutral. Well, try to understand that I put a lot of time and resources and effort into these reviews. Some of these reviews can take months, and I'm thinking in specific the Explore Scientific ED-127 refractor. That review took something like three and a half months. I really wanted to get that one out sooner. So I'm not sure it's really a great investment of my time and my resources to be putting that kind of effort into negative reviews. But I think we can make an exception for this particular model. Boy, do you people hate this thing. Your hate for this model seems to know no bounds. In fact, if you want to amuse yourself, go to any amateur astronomy internet chat room or news group or forum, anything like that, and post that you're thinking about buying one of these, and then just sit back and watch what happens. <laughs> so is this the worst telescope that you can possibly buy? Of course not. There's a lot of $50 grade junk toys on Amazon, never intended to be used seriously. But is, there's, is this model getting extra hate? Well, it might. I mean, it's coming from Celestron. They should know better. They seem to be selling a ton of these, and I think the price is low enough. And if you don't know telescopes, you see this thing from a distance, it sort of looks like it might be the real deal, even though it isn't. People buy these things. They can't get them to work, and then they bring them to you in astronomy clubs, and you guys are all sick of hearing about it. It happens here, too. All the time I get questions about this model, you know, I bought this thing, I can't seem to figure out how to use it. So if you grade it on the curve, so to speak, this, you know, you can make a case this is the worst possible thing that you can buy. So I'm going to try to be civilized about all of this. But let's get this thing up on a mount, and let's talk about what's gone wrong here. There's quite a lot of it. And here we are with the Power Seeker 127. You know, Celestron, they make some great products. Unfortunately, this isn't one of them. This sample was purchased by a club member, typical beginner story. He bought this not knowing what he was doing, couldn't get anything to work on this, and has since moved on to an 8-inch Aperture Dobsonian. Life has gotten a lot better for him. Okay, so if you know telescopes, if you've been around them for a while, you're probably already seeing a couple of things that don't seem quite right. For example, the optical tube is a 5-inch f8, but the tube is much too short to support 1,000 millimeters at first glance. Yes, folks, this is the dreaded Bird-Jones type design. There is a relay lens inside the focuser here, extending the natural focal length of the mirror out to 1,000 millimeters. So we need to be clear here, there is nothing inherently wrong with a Bird-Jones type design, but such is the infamy of this one model, nobody wants one anymore. Raising the focal length raises the magnification, making everything harder to find, putting extra stress on the mount to hold everything steady. It is the worst possible thing you can do to a beginner. But things get even worse. In the package, they include this. It's a Barlow lens. Not at just a 2x, but a 3x Barlow lens, thereby guaranteeing that everything that you see through the telescope will be three times worse. <laughs> it's a cheap piece of plastic. I tried this in a couple of my other telescopes. It isn't very good. The problem with the Barlow is that when people see that you can double, or in this case, triple the magnification, they're going to use it. <laughs> I once had a conversation with an industry insider and asked him, why do you do this? Why do you put a Barlow lens inside the package? All this does is confuse the beginner. And he said to me, yeah, we know, we know that, we know what's wrong, but the marketing people are saying that you have to do it. If the beginner knows that you can double or triple the magnification with the use of one device, it's more likely they're going to buy the product. You know, very often with a cheap telescope, you can usually get a consolation prize. You can keep the finder or the eyepiece in, move it to something else. In this case, you can't really do that. The finder is just awful. It's listed as a 5x24, but it isn't really that. If you look inside the front lens, there is a field stop just inside the lens that stops the aperture way down, almost to the point where you're better off looking with the naked eye. The optics are quite poor, and it's very difficult to see anything with it. The eyepiece, well, 
It comes with a 20 millimeter eyepiece. And again, first in a series of really puzzling decisions here made on behalf of the telescope. The first was making this a Burr-Jones type design. The second here, it's an erecting prism eyepiece. It's, uh, I don't know, what were you thinking? This thing is notorious for its badness. I've seen these before. The field of view is the size of a drinking straw. And I would report on the quality of this one, except this one is broken. It doesn't work. There's eyepiece elements rattling around inside. If this were a simpler design, I would consider opening this up and trying to fix it, but there's a lot of complicated stuff in here and I would have no idea how to go about aligning the prisms or fixing this. So 20 millimeter eyepiece, useless. Even more useless is they give you a four millimeter eyepiece. Four, that's 250 power in this thing. There's no way the quality of the optics are going to support anywhere near that power, let alone this flimsy mount, which isn't going to hold it steady. But the problem is you know what people are going to do. Some beginners will see that this is the high power eyepiece. They're going to take this, put it in the Barlow lens and put this in here. I'm gonna do the math for you. 750 power. I'm trying to think, have I ever used a telescope at that magnification? So again, those of you who know telescopes probably recognize this mount. This is the same low grade mount that you see on many inexpensive telescopes. The last version of one of these I encountered was in the review of the Orion Space Probe 2, where I declared that with some modification, it was barely acceptable. Keep in mind in that review, that optical tube weighed three pounds and had a focal length of 700 millimeters. This one weighs almost seven and a half pounds and it has a focal length of a thousand millimeters. It puts it into a different class. Things really do need to be steady with those figures. And I've got everything tightened down, but you can see it's already moving. This is unacceptable underneath the night skies. So, you know, I would report on this thing, except what's happening with this one, and I'm not really sure, but this is the right ascension axis on these slow motion cables. I've never liked these things. They don't seem to work right. They always seem to fall off when you least want them to. But what's worse is this one, and I don't want to turn it too much, but it, it's broken, it's jammed. It, the right ascension axis on this one doesn't turn at all. That is the only reason you want an equatorial mount. So again, this thing's a non-starter, I couldn't use it. Another hint here is that if you were looking at the telescope, you can see that the mounting rings are a little bit too close together. If you were designing this thing from scratch, the rings would probably be a lot further apart. This is an indication that perhaps you know, this was rated from a parts bin from another telescope just to marry the two parts together and get it out the door. Okay, with the mount a non-starter, I decided to keep going. Am I a glutton for punishment? Maybe. So what I did is I took the rings and I mounted it on a Vixen compatible plate, put it on my Celestron AVX mount, and started to use it. And of course, the finder is just worthless. So I did this. I've shown this before. It's a Rigel quick finder that I've mounted on an elastic band. It projects a red dot at infinity. My blood pressure went down quite a bit by doing this. Keep in mind, at this point, I have surrounded this optical tube with well over $1,000 worth of material just for the privilege of looking through it. I've also put a Teleview 19 millimeter panoptic because, again, the supplied eyepiece was a non-starter. And how does it look? Well, it's not very good. So I'll show you the main problem. So if this is the field of view, if you have a circle that you're looking through with the eyepiece, only about the middle 50% or so is sharp. As you get further out, it gets worse. Stars aren't points. They turn into lines or comets or all sorts of strange shapes. So I did my duty. I tried to look at things through it. I looked at the Andromeda galaxy. I looked at the double cluster. I looked at M15, the globular cluster. I looked at the Dumbbell Nebula. None of this was easy. It was mentally exhausting. It wasn't fun. It was a relief to stop using it. Okay, so what can you do instead? So these are standard beginner recommendations that you'll find in almost any responsible guide on amateur astronomy. You'll see these products recommended over and over again. So first of all, let's cut Celestron a break and recommend one of their binoculars. These are their up-close 7x35s. You can also get the 7x50s well under $100, much better than that telescope. So if I have $200 US to spend on a telescope, 
I'm buying an Orion Star Blast. That's this green teal Dobsonian tabletop reflector that you see here. A much simpler device than the Power Seeker, but all of the parts work. No silly relay lens, no Barlow, no trick eyepieces. Everything's simple, it's easy to use, and it works. There's a Skywatcher Heritage 150P all the way at the end there. That's a collapsible Dobsonian that you've seen me review before. That one is available in a six inch and a five inch version. This is an Orion Short Tube 80. This is an optical tube only, so just be aware it does need a sturdy tripod. And as a general rule of thumb, if you have tripods lying around the house, they probably aren't strong enough for astronomy, so get the biggest and heaviest one you can and use it this way. There's also the Orion X-T 4.5. This is a four and a half inch F8 Dobsonian. It's sort of in between a tabletop and a floor stander. This is very good as well. So there you have it, a look at your most hated telescope. You know, the series of problems and frustrations we see in this is indicative of a lot of department store grade entry level stuff that we're always trying to steer people away from. You run into one problem after another and eventually you just give up. One really frustrating thing about this product is it actually isn't that far off. With a few changes, this thing might actually be kind of usable. Get rid of the silly relay lens and the focuser. Get rid of that trick 20 millimeter eyepiece. Replace it with a 25 or a 32. I don't know what you're doing with a 20 millimeter at this focal length. Please get rid of the Barlow and please get rid of that awful four millimeter eyepiece. I would think if the company did these things, it would ultimately save money. You're having to produce less product. So this thing has all the earmarks of having been designed by somebody who doesn't use telescopes. Please don't buy this. Stick with standard recommendations. You're gonna be a lot better off. So again, this one was loaned to me from a club member. You know, when he dropped it off, he said, take your time, I don't need this back anytime soon. Yes, I know the implication. No such luck, my friend. You're getting this back. So thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.